to, uh, uh, to start a brand new week and turn the page from the old week is an encouragement, is it not? I'll tell you. Title of our message this morning is Get Your Annual Spiritual. I, not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, had my annual physical. Maybe you guys have physicals too. Um, this is an annual spiritual that we want to talk about here this morning. Uh, this past week, I just as soon forget some of the happenings of this past week. If you ever have a week like that, uh, I, I don't care if it is raining today. I'm happy that it's starting a brand new week. I was able to get my annual concussion out of the way this past week. That was a blessing. And the ambulance ride was a little shorter than last year. So that was good, too. This past week, there was some significant news that came out, and the news that I'm speaking of is that of the uh, homegoing of Billy Graham. Billy Graham was 99 years old, and he passed away into eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're thankful for the testimony that the, the evangelist had. I happened to see the, the news come across, and it uh, came across, there was a CNN article that popped up on my computer, and I was reading this CNN article that made me very upset uh, they put a spin on Billy Graham's life that he uh, was questioning his faith and that uh, he had a friend who was questioning his faith and it went on and on and it was not at all accurate nor true, but they felt like they were at liberty to put that type of a spin on it. Later on that next day, I was listening to XM Radio on the car and I was listening to the Christian station and they said that on channel 145, they were broadcasting the Billy Graham channel. Uh, so this past week, I've been listening to Billy Graham's preaching while I'm driving down the road. And uh, Karen and I were listening to uh, some of the preaching. It is really amazing when you listen to some of the preaching that he had early in his life. At the end of his life, when he was in his 80s, obviously, a little bit less intense, um, you're slowing down by the time you're 88 years old, you know, I mean, just a little bit. Um, but I'm listening to messages that he preached back in 1958. I'm listening in 1963. And I'm telling you what, he is preaching so hard against sin. I mean, he, I was listening this morning. He was doing the handwriting on the wall message. And he was preaching so hard against sin. And he said, there is not one sin that's ever been practiced by mankind that's not being practiced right now tonight in the United States of America. And he calls all the time the people to repent. Now listen, if you see my pickup truck on the side of the road with the four-way flashers on, don't stop to help me. It's not that I have a mechanical problem. Uh, but every time he gives an altar call, I need to pull over. And so as I'm listening to these messages, they're so convicting. I mean, they really are convicting. Uh, I, you know, I, I hear that preaching and I think to myself, there's really not much of that preaching in the United States anymore. In fact, uh, there's uh, a question in my mind popped up. I thought if he was candidating at a church, I wonder if many churches would even be interested in having a preacher preach like that on a weekly basis, to preach that strongly against sin and call people to repentance is almost unheard of today. But it was not unheard of back in Paul's day. In fact, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians here is going to make a plea and he is going to plea for the people. And there's three pleas from the passage that I'd like to look at here this morning. Three things that really stand out where the Apostle Paul is calling on people to repent and calling on them to examine their heart and calling on them to exercise some level of maturity in their Christian life. The Apostle Paul's pleas are without a doubt emphatic. He has much to say. He is not mingling his words. He is very, very clear in this presentation. And I pick this up here in chapter 12 and verse 19. Paul writes it. He says, all this time you've been thinking that we are defending ourselves to you. And actually, it is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ. And all for your upbuilding, beloved, for I am afraid that perhaps when I come, I may find you to be not what I wish and may be found by you to be not what you wish. That perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. He says, I'm afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you, and I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past and not repented of the impurity, immorality, and sensuality which they have practiced. Let's ask God to bless our time, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you 
for this word. We thank you, Father, for giving to us uh, the Bible, the scriptures, Lord. And as we understand, uh, these words are, are what you want us to put in our hearts today. So we pray, Father, your blessing on this passage of scripture and the words beyond this uh, in chapter 13 as well. And may you speak to our hearts, Father, in such a way that moves us to action today. We thank you for all of it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Noticing here in this passage of Scripture, Paul's making this plea for repentance. And he says that what I don't want to have happen is I don't want to have it happen that when I come to visit you, uh, that I'm disappointed in you and you're disappointed in me. I don't, I don't want to have that reality again for the second time. This is something that had happened in the past, and Paul is trying to avoid that. And that's the reason for the severe letter that he had sent to the Corinthian church years prior. And he's calling on them to be repentant repentant, and he's acknowledging the fact that if this isn't remedied, there are a whole bunch of really nasty things that could take place. And he lists those things, and they're pretty amazing. He says quarreling. He's, he's going to list that out. He's going to say, uh, when we get together, I, I don't want there to be strife. I don't want there to be jealousy or angry tempers and disputes. I don't want there to be slanders and gossip and arrogance and disturbances. I, I'm not looking, he says, for that to happen. Amos says, how could two walk together unless they be agreed? The Apostle Paul is seeking for an agreement on these issues of sin and how the people here would address these areas in their lives that are not within the parameters of Scripture. And so Paul is going to say, you know, we're, we're truly trying to come and minister to you in such a way that is going to be profitable, but while these issues remain, we're going to be disappointed in you, and you're going to be disappointed in us. And the reason why they would be disappointed in Paul is that Paul has called them to repentance while the super apostles who have moved into the, the birth there at, uh, in Corinth, they're going to say there's no reason for this repentance to have to take place. And so they're going to be at odds. It's going to be a nasty confrontation. And what Paul is saying is, I don't want that to happen. He goes into this, and if you notice here, uh, towards the end of chapter 12, uh, he says that um, there are many, he says, I don't want to mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past. Now, we all sin, don't we? We all sin. We all commit sin. Even as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a born-again child of God, I commit sin. But the difference here with these folks is that he is saying that there were actually many of them who were committing sin, and by sinning, they refused to be repentant. And so once they were confronted with their sin, they looked at their sin, and they thought about it, and they thought to themselves, we'd rather be able to participate in this sin. And so they put up a wall, and they refused to be repentant. Even though the Spirit of God is convicting their heart, they refuse to be repentant. So that wall is up. And the Apostle Paul is going to point out that this is not just a one-time act. This is something that is ongoing. In fact, he would say that the, the, the sins are grave sins. He mentions uh, iniquities, impurities, uh, immoralities, uh, sensuality. They were uh, sexual sins of nature. And he's looking at that and saying, this is not at all acceptable behavior. Remember, Corinth is a really wicked city, and immorality is abounding in Corinth. I remember a seminary professor who said, when you get out there in ministry, Kevin, everything that you see, all the sins in the world, you'll find those sins eventually in the church. Well, that's probably true. But those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, when we confront sin, we need to be willing to put the sin away, amen? We're trying to repent of that sin because we have a goal, and our goal is to be like Jesus Christ, and we know Christ has in him no sin whatsoever. And so we have a very important role in, in making certain that our walk with the Lord is a close one. Paul says at the very end of that chapter, that the practice of these areas that are sinful, he says, is a common practice. He says, this is what they are practicing. It's an ongoing thing. It's not like this is a one-time sinful act. This is a pattern of behavior that's going on in their lives that they refuse to repent of. And so the Apostle Paul is calling them to repent of this sin. I, I remember when uh, 
uh, back in the 1980s, we had moved into a house that we built. Uh, we'd just gone to a new ministry in Pennsylvania, and I had a big box of books there in the basement, and I remember uh, my son looking through that, and he was looking through it. He would have been about four years old, and he's looking through, and he, he looked at a, this, this book, and he pointed at the book, and it was a picture of Billy Graham on the cover. And Billy Graham was, was he had his Bible, you know, like, like, like and, and he said, Dad, he said, what is he so mad about? Now, how do you explain that to a four-year-old? Well, I went into a big thing. Say, sit down, let's, let's talk. <laughs> but could you imagine what it would look like if Billy Graham, somehow back in his 30s, in the prime of his preaching, would have parachuted into the center square of Corinth, taken five minutes to look around to see all the debauchery and sin, and then started to preach? Could you imagine what it was like? I think it's the same thing with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is preaching for all he's worth. He's calling these people to repentance, and these people are not listening to this, and it's causing a division among the apostle and among these people. And so he's very passionate in his plea. He's saying, come out, come out from these sinful tendencies that you have in your life and lay this stuff aside. It shouldn't be there in a believer's life. And so there's that plea for repentance. Moving on now to chapter 13, he's going to make a very clear statement. It's one that um, we might remember this little quip. But in verse one, this is the third time he says, I'm coming to you. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. In other words, you're accusing me of different things, and I'm going to come back to you, but we need to establish what the truth is and who said what. He says, I've previously said when present and second time, and though now absent, I say in advance to those who have sinned in the past and to all the rest as well, that if I come again, I'll not spare anyone since you are seeking for proof of the Christ who speaks in me and is not weak towards you, but mighty in you. For indeed, he was crucified because of weakness. My friends, everything that the apostle Paul is being accused of he probably would be accused of in our day and age as well. Because the things that were measurements of a super apostle were not evident in the apostle Paul's life. These people were being told that, listen, if you're truly a super apostle, you're going to have certain characteristics. And one of the characteristics is how you look. How you look is important. The apostle Paul evidently didn't capture anyone with his great looks. And so they looked down at him. He mentions earlier his lack of eloquence. Maybe some of these, these super apostles could speak like the guy on TV, and uh, they were really amazing in the words that they used and the colorful language that they used, and everyone was drawn in. They're looking at Paul and saying, you know, Paul, you're pretty knowledgeable, but you're really not up to par when it comes to eloquently speaking in front of big crowds. They looked at his lifestyle. Paul, what kind of lifestyle is this? You're at the church, you're, you're preaching, you're killing yourself, you're doing all this work, and you're still making tents. Your lifestyle. You're, you're in one place now, you're in another place later. Where are you putting down your roots? Where's your house? Where do you live? What's your lifestyle really like? It didn't measure up. They also looked at his experience. I mean, if you're successful, how many times should you really be beaten? You know? How many times should you have a shipwreck? I mean, seriously, I mean, should you be like bitten by poisonous snakes. I mean, there's a certain level of, are you kidding me, right? I mean, it's kind of like, what? What happened to him now? You're in prison? You, 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 this has happened to you? I'm not sure about this guy. I mean, another shipwreck on top of everything else that he's gone through and beaten and stoned to death. I mean, almost all these things, and now he's, you know, going down a basket on a rope, and he's diving out of a city that, I, I mean, I'm telling you what, his experiences are not up to the super apostles level, you know what I mean? Like, we come rolling into town with our entourage, we're given the best hotel in town, and we go stand, and everyone applauds for him when they get there, and they give a beautiful, eloquent speech, and they put some serious del re me in your hand. That's how a super apostle conducts himself. Paul, what is your problem? Paul points to Jesus Christ and he says, I'm no different than Jesus. I'm no different than Jesus. Jesus is God himself come in the flesh and he's beaten and he hangs on a cross and there's a crown of thorns on his head jammed down so that the blood is flowing down and the Bible says that his, his, his face is obscured. He, he's beaten, he's, he's, he's tortured, he's despised. When he goes through it all, his, his main disciples deny him. They scatter like the wind. 
uh, Jesus, where's your house? Where are all your followers? Where's your money? Where's, <laughs> where's the signs of success? Paul, where's your wealth? I mean, these would all be factors in trying to determine if you really are a super apostle. But in the weakness, Paul says as he turns to Jesus and he points to Jesus, he says, look at his weakness. And it is in his weakness, in the amount of, of suffering that he was willing to go through for us, that we see the mighty power of Almighty God. And we see the almighty power of God working in the apostle Paul as well as he delineates all of the struggles that he has had with life. So this is the Apostle Paul. Now what Paul does is he spins things around and he says to them, if you want to test me, I'm looking at Jesus Christ and he is the example. He says, I want to ask you to examine your own life. Notice verse 5. In chapter 13 and verse 5, we read here, he says, uh, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. And uh, New American Standard has an exclamation point. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Look at your own life. Check out your own heart and life. It's important that you take the time to be able to test yourself. Now, one thing is true, and it's true about all of us, is that the only way you would know that I'm a Christian or not is by what you see externally, right? Do you agree with that? What you see externally is, is really the catalyst. And I know the same thing about you from external observations. The truth of the matter is only I and God know that I've, I've really made peace with him, if I've really called on his name. You may think you know something about me, and hopefully my testimony would bear out the reality that I am saying I'm a child of God, and I truly am. But in my heart, I know what I believe, and God knows it as well. So when the apostle turns to these people and says, test yourself, examine yourself, he is calling on them to be very honest with themselves. Now, at the root of it, I believe Paul, as we, we won't spend the time to develop it all, but I believe he believes that they truly are saved. And, but yet he's asking them to test themselves as they have been testing him. And there's a point to be well taken. You and I should spend a moment in our time to stop and look at our own life and make certain that we're right with God. Because there is nothing more important than that, because in light of all of eternity, this decision or lack of a decision is going to make huge implication for us for all of the days ahead. And eternity, my friends, is a very long time, and no, I don't understand it. But the Bible speaks about eternal life and eternal damnation in very real terms. And so we want to make sure that we've made peace with God. And isn't it true that as the Apostle Paul is going to call them uh, to examine themselves, that they want to pass this test? Paul uses this word, dokimos, uh, to refer to Apollos, who's tested and approved, Romans chapter 16. He, he also tells uh, the Corinthians, back in 1 Corinthians, as he's talking about um, um, when he's preached to others, he says, I, I make sure that my body is in subjection so that when I preach to others, I myself wouldn't be disqualified. The word disqualified is that same Greek word for tested with a prefix to it that gives the negative connotation. So it's, I've been not passing this. I've actually failed this test. And so he is saying, basically, you have to be careful that you don't fail this test. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 8 has a, a great picture of failing. It says, but land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless. It is without passing this test. It is a failed test. All of this to say that we have to be very careful that within our own hearts we have looked and we have observed and what we see is satisfying to know that we have peace with God. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 4 uses the same word. It says, but each one must examine his own work, and then he'll have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another, for each one will bear his own load. Each one must examine his own work. Kind of comes from that 
maxim, know yourself. Self-examination, taking the time to really look at your life and determine, are you truly in the faith? Going back to 2 Corinthians 5, he says, see if you're truly in the faith. Another way that could be translated, and I'm leaning more that way, is to see whether you are holding the faith. The idea is that not only are they to to look at their life and say, yes, I'm in Christ, and, and say, well, I've said a prayer, but it is much bigger than that. When they look at their life, they're to look at it from the standpoint of its entirety and understand as the body of proof is concerned, do I demonstrate a true walk with the Lord? Am I truly living out my Christian life within the parameters of the Scripture? Now, that's a very important point because the Corinthians were not living within the lines. Uh, All of those sexual sins that Paul accuses them of is demonstration of the fact that they are being disobedient to the Word of God. Now, when you and I are disobedient to the Word of God, one of the byproducts of disobedience is a lack of assurance of our faith. Now, talk to people who aren't sure They've maybe made a prayer in the past, but they're not sure about whether they're truly saved. And normally when that's the case, it's because there's unconfessed, unrepentant sin that's involved in their life. Now I know because I lived this out myself. I remember a pastor coming and visiting me when I was in Bible college. He uh, came and see me uh, during the summer. And uh, he said, uh, I, I hear you're having a, a moment of, of you're not sure, maybe you need to repent and be saved. And uh, he scolded me and uh, showed me the scriptures and called me to repent and start walking anew with the Lord as I should have been. And I did that, and those lack of assurances went away. And I began to understand that that sin will rob us from assurances because the devil will always creep in and try to get us to doubt. And it's important that we have that assurance of salvation. That's why Paul is pleading so much so for repentance. And then as he goes into this, he's also uh, saying, listen, there needs to be self-examination. I remember back um, many, many years ago, um, about the time I was born actually, Uh, my mother went with her mom and her sister to a Billy Graham crusade. My mom was just telling me this this week, and she said, Grandma went forward, and so did uh, your aunt. Uh, The two of them went forward at the invitation, and she said, I was struggling with assurance of salvation myself, and she said, that message just brought me the reassurance that I needed as he unfolded those scriptures, and what a blessing that truly is. That's what comes with looking at our own life and being certain that we are a child of God. We've made that decision to place our faith in Jesus Christ and it has been firmly established. Now Paul's third plea here in this passage of scripture is a plea for maturity, a plea for maturity. Now you'll notice here, yeah, I'll get to the car in a minute, but as the Apostle Paul is talking, notice in verse 9 where Paul says, for we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you're strong. This we also pray for, that you be made complete. Verse 11 says, finally, brethren, rejoice, and he's given this whole list. He says, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, like-minded, and live in peace. Again, he says, be made complete. Now, when we see the word complete, most of the time, our thought process is the Greek word teleos, which means come to maturity. But here in this time, the noun is actually a word. It's the only place it's really used in the New Testament in this exact form. There's some some very similar terms that are used a couple of places. But what he's saying here is that we are supposed to be desiring to be perfect. That's what he's saying. That's the best way to translate that. We pray that you be made perfect. Now the terminology there is interesting because if you look at the verb form for this word, it's used often to the tune of restoring something. 
bringing about original condition or making something fit for a greater purpose. Um, sometimes it was re referred to um, with regard to walls that were needing to be refinished or preparing fabric uh, to, to wear, um, maybe working on a, a remedy, uh, a medicinal, and I'm talking about ancient usages of this word, um, making a, a, a vase or something, a vessel, actually uh, making it ready to hold something. Um, there were so many different ways. It was re used to relocate or um, put back a reset, a dislocated bone, or outfitting a boat. I mean, it could be broad in its terminology. But when you think of it, I want you to think of it as the process of restoration, because that's most closely what the Apostle Paul is talking about. He uses this term, for instance, in Ephesians chapter 4 uh, for equipping the saints, and uh, also in verse 10 of chapter 5, it's, it's 1 Peter 5, 10. He's talking about restoring someone who has suffered from persecution in this world. And Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, we just read Galatians 6, 4, but Galatians 6, 1 says, brethren, uh, even uh, if, if anyone is uh, caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. So that word restore is in Galatians 6, 1 is the same Greek word that's used here in 2 Corinthians. So the idea is a restoration process. Does that make sense? So we're kind of thinking as the Apostle Paul that there are times when we need to be restored spiritually. Now there's an old car that needs to be restored and it's being restored. You notice that the paint is all gone. Boy, it drives me crazy when I see a classic car that's got about five coats of paint on it. And people buy these cars, they think, well, I'll just throw a coat of paint on it. It looks terrible. You can see how thick it is. You know what I mean? So I've restored some cars, and I, I remember a 65 Mustang that I had, and I, I put chemicals on it, and I, I got it all the way down to that, just like that. They have welded a new quarter panel onto that one, and I did the same thing with mine. Uh, but I had that all stripped down to bare metal. Bare metal looks like shiny stainless steel. And some brilliant person at the shop thought it was a good idea to back it out of the garage there for the afternoon, and it rained. Bare metal, it rained. I had a lot more work to do to get it back to where it needed to be. It did come out great, and it, uh, it, was, a, it was a blessing, but boy, it took a long time. It's a good investment. So here's um, the process. It's a, it's a long process. Everything gets taken apart, and it could be a ground-up restoration where everything is, is taken apart right down to the chassis, or it could be one that is uh, basically the chassis up. Here it is, it's coming together. You can see that they're starting to paint some of the door jams, some of the places you can't see but still need to be painted. And uh, there you go, what a beautiful interior. White leather and uh, fancy steering wheel and it's really coming along and there you have the finished product. I want you to think of restoration but a spiritual restoration. Because what Paul here is calling them to is to be restored spiritually. From the sin that was present, there needed to be an examination of their own heart and life, and that needed to lead to a desire to be useful to God. It needs to come back to that original condition. Remember, what you're looking at with that demonstration of those parts, it's almost like there we are, we were created without a sin nature. God calls us to, to the garden, Adam and Eve are there, and uh, they haven't sinned, they haven't uh, committed that trespass, and then once we sinned, we realize in Adam, all have sinned, because he has passed that down then to all of us. So we all have now a sin nature. What we need to be is restored. We need to come back to God, and the only way we can do that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man can come to the Father. Jesus made it very, very clear. No person can come to the Father except to be through Jesus Christ and him alone. We want to have a relationship with God. We want it to be restored. The only way this relationship can be restored is through faith in Christ Jesus. It's the only way. There's no other alternatives. And as such, we would understand that there are times when we do sin, when, when we go from the, the beautiful to the more ugly, and we realize, wow, we've got a long way to go. But God says to us that we can confess our sin, and he says that what he'll do is he'll bring us back uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we go through that process of cleansing, and God says... You have a right relationship with me. Notice verse 11. 
And uh, Paul's going to make this uh, very clear. He says, uh, basically, uh, he's saying, finally, brethren, be made complete. And literally, if you want to take a little pen, if you write in your Bible, aim for perfection is literally how that can be translated. Aim for perfection. That's what you want in this life. You, you want to aim for the goal. And the goal is to be like Jesus Christ, who has never sinned. This is what we're trying to do. We're aiming for that perfection. And I'm not sure if this is a passive voice or a middle voice in the original. If it's a middle voice, Paul is saying, mend your ways. If it's passive, he's saying, may your ways be mended or be restored. Either way, the same reality is true. You and I need to come to a place of maturity as a believer. We need to be growing our faith so that as we walk through this Christian life, we see the reality living out of a life that's been changed. Ephesians 4 says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed and thereby waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. You see, that's the result of of being immature, not being restored. We tend to drift. We tend to listen to things that aren't true. But we want to come to that point of maturity, and that's why Paul is pleading so much. He says we need to be speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. That's the motivation that we have as followers of Christ. A couple questions for us to stop and think about. How important is it for us to examine our own heart before the Lord? Look at our own heart. Are we truly a follower of Jesus Christ? And then second of all, how do we know if we're mature? Looking at your own life, how would you know? Are you walking with the Lord or are there things that you refuse to repent of? We can be mature in the Lord and have things that are missing. We can be mature in the Lord and not have 100% perfection because none of us are going to reach that here, are we? The one thing we should have is the ability to demonstrate a closer walk with Jesus Christ. And as we, as we look at our lives, we recognize that, that certain sin that was part of the past, and as Paul said, many of you uh, were involved in this. We've repented of that. and We've moved forward. That is the process of sanctification that God desires. And so Paul ends chapter 13 here with some serious pleas. And he is without a doubt concerned about the Corinthian church. And he wants so much when he goes back there for them to be on the same page spiritually. Desiring the same thing. Earnest in their faith. As he desires, as God desires for us today as well. Would you bow your heads with me please? Let's just take a moment to look into our own lives. As we look into our life this morning, maybe you're here and as you examine your own heart before the Lord, you in all honesty would say, I have some issues, I have some doubts, I have some things that concern me. Uh, maybe you'd be here this morning and say, I'm not certain that if I died today, I'd spend my eternity with God in heaven. There are some questions that are lingering. My friend, the Bible tells us these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. That's God's desire for us. He wants us to know that we are on our way to heaven. If you have doubts here this morning and there's things that I can pray for you about, I'd be happy to do that. There's nothing better than being honest before God with ourselves. He sees our heart and we know our heart. If you're here this morning and say, Pastor Kevin, God's, God's speaking to my heart today. There's some things that are rattling around in my head that I want to get an answer to. I, I'm not sure if I'm in the right spot spiritually. I'm not sure if I'm trusting the right thing. You're here this morning and say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. There's some things I, I want to know the answers to. God's at work in my heart. Is there anyone at all? You just slip up your hand. I'd be happy to pray for you this morning. Thank you. You're here this morning. Thank you. You're here this morning, and maybe you'd say to yourself, I, I want to be honest. Am I aiming for perfection? 
or are sins ever present in my life, things that I'm not repenting of and I'm finding in my life that I am just repeating over and over the same mistakes. I mean, how many here would say with me, as I raise my hand, Lord, I'm aiming for perfection. I'm aiming for perfection. Help me, Lord. Just slip up your hand if you're like me. I'm aiming for perfection. Amen. I believe it's important for us to understand that we need to be here for each other, to encourage each other to get to that point. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed on us. We think specifically of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for these who've asked for prayer today, and Lord, I don't know their hearts, but you do. And I pray, Father, that they would find peace in the answer to the questions that are in their hearts and minds. That they would know the peace of God, Lord, that passes all understanding. That there would be a comfort in knowing for sure that they are in a right relationship with their Creator. Work in their hearts today. Work in all of our hearts, Father, today as we aim for perfection, Lord. We recognize that in this world we can't be perfect, but we recognize, Father, that there is a goal, and that goal is to be Christ-like, and we know that Christ is perfect. So, Father, help us, I pray, to set our sights on things above and not things below. And may we understand, Lord, the importance of encouraging each other to walk with you in a way that's pleasing, that we might demonstrate a maturity, a Christian maturity in our world today. And I pray this all now, and I ask it in Christ's precious name. Amen. Kendra's going to come and speak to our hearts in song this morning. I can breathe. 
Well, thank you, Kendra. Just uh, an announcement here this morning before, uh, before we split for the week. Um, just a couple of things here, actually, I want to mention. Um, one is, um, on the behalf of the elders, I wanted to mention that there are seasons in the life of a church um, in much the same way there are in a family or even personal lives. Um, for the past few months, the elders here have been looking at our current staffing as well as seeking God's wisdom for our future and needs. And we've been led to uh, make a change with regard to Steve Nemeth and his uh, working with the youth. And so it's kind of a big announcement, obviously, to uh, make. We love Steve, and uh, he's a hard worker. He'll be moving to um, an internship uh, with regard to assisting the pastors, the three of us, in areas of the church that right now are currently um, not being ministered to, some different things that we have gaps in. And uh, we're looking forward to working with Steve as we try to address some of those needs. Uh, the youth group uh, will continue. Um, but it will continue with uh, Chris and Beth Pritchett filling uh, the gap, the intermediary time um, here as they will be uh, taking that on and we're not sure how long that uh, even is. I'd ask for your prayers as the elders um, are working on developing a job description and so forth and uh, trying to do that in the next week. And so we're, um, this has been going on uh, and this has been coming for some time, um, but we're trying to explore some different options as we look to some of the staffing needs that we have here. We're excited about what God is doing and uh, we're certainly thrilled about um, the, the future. Uh, one of the blessings that we've seen is obviously with our change with our times. Uh, we've gone from about 50 people involved in uh, Sunday school classes to about 175 adults in uh, the ABFs, so that's pretty huge. Um, that's uh, even beyond uh, what we were hoping for, so that's kind of an exciting uh, reality. Um, I, I won't speak on behalf of the elders, but I will say I'm excited. I think, I think we're going to need to be building some stuff around here um, and, uh, and, and making some, some uh, additional uh, ads, and so uh, I think it's an exciting time, and uh, you're the reason for that, and, and we're thankful, but it seems like God is doing some great things here, so uh, we're pleased by that. So along the way, there's obviously church staffing decisions and some different things that we'll have to be working on. And so we'd ask for your continued prayer uh, during, um, and I, I won't say just a transitionary time because it's not. It's just uh, as we see the ministry uh, growing and developing, I'm excited about some opportunities with regard to outreach and some different things that we're going to try to do. So stay tuned. There's, there's more information that will be flowing to you uh, in the, the weeks ahead. And uh, if you um, wouldn't mind praying, we would be excited to have you pray, all right? Um, so there's, there's been a lot of blessings. Take your bulletins. Don't forget to, to look through the, the different things that are going on. There's a lot happening with men's, women's ministries um, and, and all kinds of different things that are going on out there in the foyer. You can sign up for things uh, where you can use your spiritual gifts for the Lord uh, there as well. But um, I don't have a, a buzzer, so that's why I'm going on and on. Every time that buzzer rings, I think there's somebody at the door. And it's like, yeah, let them in. Let's stand. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. It's really been a blessing, Father, and we're very, very thankful that we can come and we can worship you in this way. And I'm thankful, Father, that uh, we have as uh, believers uh, so much in common, Lord. Uh, we're thankful for our faith in Christ. We're thankful, Father, for uh, the reality of, of knowing our eternal destination is secure in Christ. But, Father, also knowing that we don't walk the Christian pathway alone, that, Father, uh, we're here for each other. So help us, Lord, to be a church that really uh, is a church that encourages each other in our faith, that we might walk, Lord, in a way that's pleasing to you. Lord, as we look forward to this week, we pray, Lord, that um, there wouldn't be a lot of adventure, but there'd be a real blessing in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.